She's over 25 years in biomedical science, building an international profile uh, on cross-disciplinary collaboration and global engagement. Uh, she's published more papers than Harry Moore would care to remember. Uh, and she directs the, Institute, the UCD Institute for Discovery, uh, where she's recently launched the UCD AI Healthcare Hub. And she is going to be talking to us this morning about revolutionising pre-eclampsia diagnosis and how AI is transforming maternal and neonatal health care. So please put your hands together for Professor McGuire. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Garvin, for that very kind introduction. And thank you so much to everybody for coming this morning. Um, I was here last night and I was at the music, so thank you for coming this morning and, and uh, being in fine fattle. So as Garvin said, my name is Patricia McGuire. And uh, so it's a real privilege to be here today. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me and uh, for Garvin for leading the um, charge on that. So I'm going to talk to you about a project that I've been involved in now for a number of years called AI Premi. And this is a, you know, a project on preeclampsia. And I just wanted to say before I start, if you've ever been affected by this or if anybody in your family has been affected by this, you know, please come up to me afterwards and tell me your story because your story is what gets me up out of bed in the morning. Um, so, and you'll understand what I mean, for those who don't know anything about it, you'll understand what I mean after I've talked you through my first couple of slides. If I actually can uh, move the, uh, no, it's not moving. Okay. Have we got the next slide, please? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I don't think it will move for me when I press next, but do I have to direct it at the... No? Okay, not to worry. Okay, well, um, if you can move to the next slide, I'd be very grateful, but I can start talking. So um, the problem I'm dealing with is preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. It's a complication. And what do I mean by hypertensive? Well, hypertensive is... Hypertensive is high blood pressure in pregnancy. So it sounds very innocuous almost, but it affects one in every 12 pregnancies. And one in every 12 pregnancies, but usually people haven't actually heard about preeclampsia. So it can be very mild for some people, and sometimes it can be very devastating. So this is a picture of Jennifer, and Jennifer unfortunately passed away in 2021 from um, preeclampsia associated complications. Now I met Jennifer's family and um, you know that's something that is such a privilege to me. I'm a, my background is biomedical science. I started off as a science degree and I've, I had never met a patient. I've worked on clinical samples for over 25 years, but ironically, I'd never met a patient. I'd never met a patient's family. Um, and this has really dramatically, in this project, I've been so privileged, it's dramatically changed my life. But I did meet Jennifer's family um, in 2021. Um, and Jennifer, you know, she was had a, a wonderful pregnancy. She was carrying twins. It was all going so well. Um, and then she started to experience some um, swelling of the ankles. You know, if... If you've ever known anybody that's ever been pregnant, um, that's pretty standard, okay? So it's not something that people generally think there's something really wrong here. So she had discomfort, and if you've, again, ever known anybody who's pregnant, they have discomfort. <laughs> and so it was a really quite a normal pregnancy. However, and she'd been carrying these twins uh, until uh, 37, 36 weeks, and she'd been fine, and that's a really long time for twins. Um, and unfortunately, it all started to go really, really um, bad, really fast. And that's what can happen in preeclampsia. Um, so she had, uh, she went into the hospital. She started feeling really sick, really fast. Sometimes, you know, women just wake up in the morning and it's an emergency situation. So that's what happened, unfortunately, to Jennifer. And she ended up going in for emergency C-section 
And unfortunately, the next day, um, she uh, deteriorated quite quickly afterwards and she just died two days after her emergency C-section from a, um, a brain hemorrhage. So, you know, this is a really shocking story, I know, for a Friday morning, first thing, but it's reality. And unfortunately, every 30 seconds as I'm speaking here, either an expectant mum or her baby will pass away from preeclampsia complications across the world. So that's a really shocking, and it always gives me goosebumps and I have goosebumps now. It's a really shocking statistic for 2023 that every 30 seconds a mum or her baby will lose their life from preeclampsia. And you can imagine that this has not just profound effects on that, on that mum, the baby, but also on their families and on their communities. I mean, this is the most, you know, our smallest, most vulnerable members of our society. And I just wanted to highlight, um, and this is an infographic from um, the um, International Society of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology. And I, I like this because it kind of, and you mightn't be able to see it actually, but um, what it does is it just gives you an idea of um, that the, the symptoms of preeclampsia can some, sometimes just be so mild. And you know, a lot of women will experience preeclampsia and be very mild and be well monitored, but it's the times that it can go wrong really fast. And that's, it's really hard to predict. Um, and at the moment, there is actually no test that can predict the future in preeclampsia. No test whatsoever. So we are still measuring preeclampsia in our maternity hospitals by looking at high blood pressure, so somebody measuring blood pressure, but also looking at protein in the urine. And this was happening, this has been happening for over 200 years. So we haven't really changed, there's been no real change in how um, this is being diagnosed. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to um, uh, uh, factors like obesity, um, hyperdensive disorders of pregnancy are rising globally. These are not decreasing. The numbers, unfortunately, for women who are suffering from um, uh, disorders and complications of pregnancy are actually rising globally. And the one thing I'll say, and then I'll stop being so negative, <laughs> the one thing I'll say is that, um, you know, every set, so, I, so some stats for you, uh, and I lay it out pretty clear, every seven minutes an expectant mum loses her life, every 45 seconds an, uh, a baby will lose their life, and when you add that together, that's the statistic of every 30 seconds. But the other thing is, sometimes an over 5 million babies are born prematurely every year, and sometimes very prematurely, because this can happen after 20 weeks of pregnancy. And if anybody, I mean, we've all been inside our mums, okay? So we all understand, you know, um, uh, what this is, but pregnancy is 40 weeks. Usually a normal healthy pregnancy is 40 weeks. So this can happen after 20 weeks. And unfortunately, really, really, um, tough conversations have to be had sometimes with the parent with the parents um, of uh, um, of this baby and um, because it's a real balance between the life of the mum and the life of the baby so yeah um, you know and it's still being di we're still diagnosing this using high blood pressure and looking at urine proteinuria and and look this a lot of the times has been done really well but unfortunately, a lot of the times it's been done really badly, and that's uh, where the statistics come from. Okay, great, my clicker now works, thank you. Um, so, I, as I said, I'm a biomedical scientist. I've been doing basic research now for over 25 years. Um, um, I started off life as a protein biochemist, German trained, and um, about 10 years ago, I was very lucky to be invited for coffee with a, a haematologist, Professor Fanula Nionia, who is on the slide here, and she invited me for coffee. And we actually came up with this idea that actually there must be a better way of finding diagnostics in the blood. Um, and that's merging what I knew about blood with the patients she saw on a daily basis in the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin.
So we came together and then um, we'd been working on the blood of sick expectant mums and trying to dig right deep. And I'll show you some of the data that we generated. And that's one thing I, and that's why I'm standing here is because I generate a lot of data. Um, and so um, we had been looking at women, uh, ex sick expectant mums, looking at their blood. We'd be doing kind of crazy stuff that people thought we were crazy to do, but we needed that blood. You know, whatever time that mum um, was diagnosed with preeclampsia, we got the blood um, and then we had to process it within an hour. So I had, my lab were amazing and we're like processing this at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning because it just had to be done. But that's what we did. Um, and um, then in, we had all of this data and it's interesting, um, we had tried for years to find funding <laughs> um, and we hadn't got funding for this. Um, and it took uh, a challenge called the AI for Societal Good Challenge, which was launched in 2019 um, by Science Foundation Ireland. Um, and it took basically standing in the coffee queue in, uh, if you know UCD, there's a new university club there. And I was standing in the coffee queue and someone came up to me and said, do you know what, Patricia, y you know, you've, you've had some tough luck with the preeclampsia project. You should apply for this funding, this AI for cycling. And I was like, what do I know about AI? <laughs> Here you go. And that was in 2019. But... Um, you know, uh, we applied and you needed a societal to champion to do so. And that's when we brought in Professor Mary Higgins. And you may know Professor Mary Higgins. She um, uh, is an obstetrician in um, the National Maternity Hospital in Hollis Street. And she was, uh, you know, very vocal advocate for women's health in Ireland and has done a lot of TV around that. So we all came together only in January 2020. Um, which, as you may recognise, was just before the world shut down in March 2020. So it was an interesting time to start a project. But um, uh, we, we came together at that time, and that's when AI Premi was born. But uh, on years of research. So I just want to tell you a little bit about my research and a little bit about my journey um, to where this is. And, and I hope, um, even though I'm going to tell you a little bit, bit of basic science, I want to give you kind of the story behind it and, and how it's kind of based on a lot of research um, over the years. So actually, I, I started off actually looking at um, blood uh, in 1999. And I suppose I had the first seminal paper actually looking at something at blood cells called platelets. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about platelets. I know it's early, um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about platelets because most people go, ah yeah, platelets, they clot our blood, you know. I cut myself, I cut myself when I'm shaving, whatever, and uh, sorry, and um, you know, they clot our blood, all great. Um, but actually, they do something that no other blood cell does. And as they actually circulate round in our blood, so you can imagine, your blood right now is circulating around in your body and your platelets are actually circulating on the outside of your blood vessels. Okay, not, it's, your blood is not uniform. Your platelets are actually pushed and it's pure plumbing. They're so small, they're, pl they're pushed to the outside of our blood vessels, okay? So they actually are looking and sensing, looking for gaps in that blood vessel. So looking for a cut, okay? That's what they're doing. So they're circulating and they're constantly suppressed down so that they don't actually come and clump together, okay? They're constantly suppressed. But what they're also doing is they're surveying our system. They're sensing as they circulate around in our blood. So you can sit there and you can think about your own blood as your platelets are looking, they're actually circulating around, sensing the environment in your blood right now, okay? And that's what I became fascinated about in about 2000. This idea that platelets actually can sense the environment and take up relevant information. And if you think about what the first thing that happens when you go into a hospital or your kids go into hospital or your parents go into the hospital, what's the first thing that happens? You get a blood test, right? You give blood and it goes off and you get results back. But that blood test, the, what they're measuring hasn't changed in decades, right? There hasn't really been new biomarkers, new ways of measuring things coming into our health system across the world. There just hasn't been 
for decades. So it always fascinated me that, you know, billions are spent every year by companies looking at blood and they're not really finding anything new. So we came up with the idea that you would actually utilize this innate ability, this ability of the platelet to actually sense the environment and take in information. And that's something that I started looking at. And this was the first kind of paper on it back in 2004. So this idea then springs that uh, platelets kind of play a much broader role, okay? So um, bear with me, I'm just gonna bring you through this. So they kind of, so everything in black is like a normal function and everything in red is like a, um, a pathologic function. So something that's bad, if you like. So, you know, it's a good thing that we don't, you know, if you cut yourself, it's a really good thing that you, you, you know, you stop bleeding and that's platelets direct that. Um, and that's hemostasis, the process of hemostasis. But then if you, you know, if they also underlie a heart attack or a stroke. So, you know, if you clot there and your platelets come together and form a clot, that's a thrombosis and that's not a good thing. And, and my lab does a lot of work on that. And that, that leads to things like, and I don't have a pointer, so I apologize, but that leads to things like a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack or an ischemic stroke or a VTE, which is, you know, everybody knows VTE because it's a deep vein thrombosis. It's what we call, you know, when somebody, for example, goes on an, a, an airplane and they get a clot in their leg, okay? That is the platelets coming together and clotting. So what I want to show you here is that because platelets sense the environment, they actually do an awful lot more. And they actually become an, involved in an awful lot more different diseases. And that's kind of where I'm interested in now, and now I've become a kind of a jack of all trades. <laughs> yeah, and I don't just work on one disease, I work on lots of different diseases, but I want to tell you the story about preeclampsia today. And I suppose I'm just showing you this because I want to show you that, so the picture on the left of the slide is this idea of resting platelets, and I kind of touched upon this, so bear with me. I've kind of touched upon this. Resting platelets are what's circulating around now on the outside of your blood vessels right now. They're all resting, all very quiescent, quiet, and happy. But if there's a cut, okay, and they sense a gap, they actually do what's in the middle. So they actually start to change shape, kind of crazy. I actually think they're amazing. I really do. They change, and I hope you see that. They actually change shape. They submit out all of this information outside into the external environment. You don't have to worry about the information. Um, but they, and then they basically form this clot. So I'm really good at getting the information that they put out into the external environment. And this is information that they've collected as they've circulated around our body. And I want to bring this back to something we all understand and something we all know. That information contains something called extracellular vesicles. Now, you're going to realize in about 30 seconds that these extracellular vesicles is something you've used maybe, you know, a lot in your life to date. And, and I wanted to ask you the question, um, and I can't see you because the lights are shining so much, but I wanted to ask you the question is, what's the first thing you do if you get a little paper cut or you have a little bit of blood on your finger, you've cut yourself? What's the first thing you would do innately? Go like this, yeah? You put it in your mouth, yeah. And actually, that's conserved across the animal kingdom. Every animal will lick their wounds. But there's actually a scientific basis for that because in all your bodily fluids, including our saliva, we have something called extracellular vesicles. And when it was actually, you know, these were kind of, they're not even really written in textbooks now. So when I teach the science students or the medical students in UCD, I'm, I, you know, I'm only teaching the kind of, they're, they're not in the textbooks that I have. I have to teach them from what I know. But this is something that even in, no, oh, it's not working. Yeah, so it, you don't have to worry about the thing, but it was only in 2018 that people, like this is only five years ago, people actually saw that in our saliva, we have these tiny little extracellular vesicles. Now you can fit a thousand of them on one human hair. 
They're tiny, okay? So they were kind of ignored because they were so small and we didn't have the equipment to see them. But it was only in 2018 that they realized that in our saliva we have little vesicles and they're actually got something called tissue factor on the surface. Now, you don't have to worry too much about tissue factor, but what tissue factor does is it speeds up the whole um, uh, hemostasis process. It actually stops you bleeding. So what you're doing when you go like this is you're using your power of your extracellular vesicles in your saliva with tissue factor on them to actually stop that bleeding and speed up wound healing. Like, how cool is that? I think that's really cool, but then I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm a nerd. <laughs> I think it's really cool. So this is amazing, but science only found this in 2018. And I know the guy, Rink Newland from, the, from um, the Netherlands that actually led on this. It's just amazing. So this is a reflex action that's conserved across the animal kingdom, but we really only understood it in 2018. And why I'm telling you about this is platelets hold these extracellular vesicles in the blood. They're, if you like, the storage compartment of extracellular vesicles in the blood. They actually generate so many of them, but they also take them in. Okay, so, and we were the lab in, in the world to show this um, in 2019, 2020. And I like to think of our extracellular vesicles. So I want to need to tell you a little bit about what they are. So I like to think of them as little drones of information. So as you're sitting there, this is physiologic. This is normal. This is another communication system in our bodies. It's like our nervous system. It's like our hormonal system. It's just people kind of ignored it. I can tell you the story about it, but I'm not, I don't have enough time. But people kind of ignored it for years because these things are so small. But these are normal. This is like our postman in our bodies. They are communicating between all our cells and they're using our bodily fluids like our blood to transport that information. And platelets are kind of cool. They actually take them up and they hoard them inside. And then when we cut ourselves, they put that information on our wound. Uh, so that they can speed up wound healing. And one thing that always fascinated me, and it was because my dad had been so sick for years, and I saw his wounds never really healed. And that's one thing as we age, and aging, I really do believe aging is a disease that we can reverse. It's a whole other conversation. Um, but aging is, and disease is accelerated aging, but, disease, but I saw that his wounds didn't heal. And you know, that's one thing that these extracellular vesicles actually do um, when they're functioning properly, they actually do proper wound healing and tissue regeneration. So what's been seen is that in disease, the contents of these and the messages that they contain within them actually start to change. And it makes sense, the communication system breaks down and we all know how important communications are right because that's what you guys do right so it's so important but this is a different type of communication system and it starts to break down so i want to convince you now that platelets actually store these they actually store these and so what you're seeing is you're seeing something an electron micrograph which basically is a particular type of microscope that actually can see them and remember these are tiny so remember what i said there's about a, you can fit a thousand of these extracellular vesicles on one human hair which i can't even hold up one human hair but you can fit a thousand of them on this so we have these microscopes that we've we're, we're so lucky in in our universities in ireland we have amazing core facilities and and i'll talk about the it infrastructure because that's why i'm standing here but we have amazing core facilities like an electron micro, um, microscopy facility which allows me to then take samples from you know um human donors and to look inside their platelets so what you're looking inside and um and you can actually, I hope you can see it, but you can actually start to see these little vesicles actually inside. And these are little extracellular vesicles inside compartments and platelets. And what you're looking at in this video is you're looking at someone in our lab, um, their blood, we took their blood, we took out their plasma, and uh, we just ran it under this particular machine and again we, we were privileged to be able to have this machine because there's not too many in the world but it's a nanoparticle tracking machine and you can so what you're seeing here is these tiny little 
vesicles and you're just seeing basically we're shining a laser on them and you see the light shining back at you and that's that's what um my lab kind of works on um is this fundamental idea that platelets store the secrets of health and disease in the information they collect and if you can get that information out you might just be able to get new diagnostics for disease it's the whole premise and so we had to do <laughs> something. Um, so again, um, um, this is kind of coming into where the machine learning comes into it. But I basically um, was was very lucky to back in 1999 to have the to have the first protein mass spectrometer for me <laughs> yeah, when I worked in a different university, but I had the very first protein mass spectrometer. Um, and like, if you've gone through the airport, you've all used, you know, like mass spectrometry has probably been used on you. You know, you get swabbed and they put it in this little machine, which is a little mass spectrometer. Um, and uh, they tell you if um, what uh, the results come back and they're usually looking for narcotics, but um, that's a particular mass spectrometer. But the one I use is a protein mass spectrometer. It costs a lot of money and they change all the time. But we, we were, again, very lucky to have core facilities that actually have the most up-to-date machinery. And so what I do is I take the blood of people um, um, with their consent, obviously, all under ethical, oh yeah, like all under, all under, uh, I love to laugh, <laughs> all under ethical, um, uh, you know, all done with ethical approval. I mean, that's the thing, I, I give a lot of talks to people from an AI background, um, and I'm always saying we're so highly regulated already in our industry, in our clinical trials that we do, you know, it's normal for us to actually think of the ethics first before we do anything. So um, that's just, a, you can ask me questions about that afterwards if you're interested. So basically what I do is I do a lot of mass spectrometry. We've worked on um, over a thousand now um, samples from different diseases and uh, then that generates a lot of data. <laughs> and, and I worked, to, so just to explain, uh, uh, um, I just used to spend my life looking at Excel spreadsheets <laughs> for a very long time. And you know, that's what I did, I didn't watch TV in the evening times, is look at Excel spreadsheets of, of lists of stuff. And um, it was actually, my husband said to me, you, you, you gotta stop. <laughs> um, you know, he's like, do you know there's better ways? So that's when I became really interested about six years ago in trying to understand that information in a better way. Um, and we started looking at advanced statistics and then we started looking at analytics platforms that, that allowed us to do um, machine learning. And now even about a couple of months ago, I have my first deep learning paper. I can't say that I am an expert, I am certainly not, but I'm very privileged to work with people that um, are. Um, so yeah, so that's the whole premise of what we do. And I'm just gonna show you some really quick data slides I wanna convince you now that if you took 32 people, 32 healthy people randomly from this room, and you looked at their platelet cargo, this information that the platelet stores, it would be the same. Okay, so we had to kind of, because we came up with this crazy idea. Most people thought we were crazy. But if you look at the blood, the platelets of 32 healthy people, it actually looks the same, right? I hope you see that. It looks the same. So that's a good thing, okay? And then we had to kind of, so we did a lot of kind of proof of principle. It looked the same when it was 32 healthy people. And then we had to kind of show, well, is there is a difference in a physiologic condition? And the physiologic, you know, Fanula worked in the rotunda, so it was easy to get, easier, not easy, but easier to get ethics to start to look at healthy pregnancy. So we wanted to look and compare um, women who were not pregnant, healthy women, and uh, women, healthy pregnant women. And I hope you can see that the pattern's different. So I always call this, and my lab laugh at me, the most expensive pregnancy test in the world. Okay, it is, like you're not going to start doing the dipstick tests, it'll never overcome that, but it is a way, if you look at the blood of a, a woman and she happens to be pregnant, you will see that she's pregnant from the pattern of her platelets, okay? So you can get the idea. So this is what we did, and then obviously these were all proof of principles, we've published this, um, and then we wanted to look at sick pregnant women. And like I said, this was, you know, this is a testament to my lab 
they were working on this because you needed the blood within an hour of um, within an hour of getting that out of the arm of the woman. So you know, Rotunda versus UCD, and the clinician that we worked with used to cycle the blood out to the out to the lab. And it was 2 a.m. in the morning and we work in the Conway Institute, if you know it, and it was at the back of the Conway Institute in the dark where there's all trees. So, I mean, it was crazy, but we did it, right? Um, and I hope you can see um, from uh, the principal components analysis that we've done here, you can completely separate out the red dots from the blue dots. And the blue dots are the healthy pregnant women and the red dots are the women um, who've been diagnosed with preeclampsia. So what we did was is we got all their information and we looked at the differences. And then those differences were, if you like, biomarkers, okay, biomarkers to actually diagnose preeclampsia. But are really the holy grail, and this is what this is what really gets me excited, is that we were able to look of those women that had preeclampsia, we were able to separate out women that were well, and you know, so preeclampsia is, is such a complication that it's, it's so different. Like if you have 10 women sitting in, in front of the clinician that have preeclampsia, they'll all have, if you like, their personalized disease. You know, they'll all have it slightly differently. It just won't be the same. And it's kind of like that for every disease, right? No one's disease is the same as the, as the next person's. So it's the same with preeclampsia. And so we wanted to group the women that um, stayed well, you know, that they were okay for a couple of days. That baby could stay inside and grow more and have a better quality of life when that baby was delivered. Um, versus the women that got sick really fast and needed to be delivered. And that baby then ended up in neonatal ICU and was very sick. So, you know, so it was a real, we needed to try and separate that. And this is what the clinicians who are involved in this project get really excited about, the fact that they'll be able to have, and it's not that it's going to make a decision for them. It's going to be a second opinion. It's going to help them make a better decision about that woman that's sitting in front of them and the life, her life and the life of her baby. I'm not actually every play, day. Is it okay if I don't play that? Actually, I don't think I don't think it's um, relevant anymore. So this is the whole thing. This is where we. This is so. This is a long way of telling you where we were when we came up to January 2020. That's where we were. That's what I was sitting with when I was standing in that coffee queue in the university club in UCD when someone said, I think you should go for that AI for Societal Good Award. So I was like, okay. Um, so we did. Um, and ironically, we had been looking for funding and, and it's something I always say, we've been we had been looking for funding from multiple different organizations and had not you know, fabulous international peer review, but we'd never been funded. <laughs> anyway, it took a AI for Societal Good Award for us to actually start to get funding. And we got 20,000 euros at the start, <laughs> might just add. So 20,000 euros, and we started off, and we, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> um, so we needed to actually now get out of mass spectrometry because, you know, hospitals don't have mass spectrometers. You don't have mass spectrometers in, across Africa, across South America. America. And you know, this is I. You know, really, what gets me up is is I want to get this to people because I, I I really do believe it's actually going to help. Um, so they don't have mass spectrometers in hospitals. So we needed to get to the stage that we had something that was being able to be utilised in 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 hospitals throughout the world. So this is, if you like, our version one. Version six, and I could talk about it a little later, is, is we want to get to a dipstick test. And, and we're going to get there. I, I really do believe that. But that's future. I have to start. I have to stop and, 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 and just stay on track. <laughs> um, um, so, so, this is, so this is what we did. We, we spent the first couple of months kind of translating this, translating what we'd found by mass spectrometry into something that could be used in any hospital across the world. We needed to be able to, um, um, I suppose, go from a research environment into a hospital. Now we're still in a research environment, but we needed to be able to prove that. 
um, and be able to, uh, and that's what we did. That was 20 grand, but we did it. Um, and we managed to get through to the next round and get 150 grand, <laughs> which was great. Um, so then we could start to actually recruit women. And this is the idea. This is where it all come to. Um, um, and the idea is that we are going to be able to provide care providers. So we work, and you'll see the team we work with. It's, it's incredible. We've got clinicians. We've got midwives. We've got people working in the labs in the hospitals. We've got um, people on the board of management in hospitals because you have to twist a lot of arms to do what we do. But look, we're going to do it. Um, and what the idea is, is that we're going to be able to give clinicians, this AI Premi solution, um, is we're going to be able to give clinicians and care providers a support tool. We're going to give them a second opinion from a very, from a very experienced colleague. That's the way we kind of think about it. A second opinion from a very experienced colleague. And we're going to, so what we're going to do is we're going to give them the biomarkers that we found through years of experience in biochemistry, good biochemistry, and we're going to put that together with all of the information that is collected in a hospital from that expectant mum. And that might sound like nothing, but actually that's not collected. It always shocks me. You know, we go into the hospital, we get, blood, we get blood tests. My dad saw a cardiologist practically every month and they didn't know he had cancer, bone cancer, until the very end, okay? It shocks me, right? It shocks me that we don't have joined up thinking in our hospitals. So it's really interesting, but the information that's collected on that expectant mum's journey from the first time she goes into that hospital is never kind of all put together and seen as one. <laughs> So that's what we're doing. It might sound like n n much, but it actually is really interesting because I should say we're actually, one of the hospitals we're working with is on paper. Just float that out there. So it's on paper. So we actually spend a lot of time, my team spend a lot of time going in and getting the information. So human error, all of that, I know, but there's only that way of doing it, right? So we're pulling all of the information together. Um, and so we're putting good biochemistry with good clinical practice, because we've loads of clinicians involved, and also bringing all of that information together. And this whole idea is this unified biosignature of preeclampsia, like a fancy way of saying, just putting all of the information together. And why am I standing here? Well, I'm standing here because it was absolutely enabled by UCD IT services. Thank you, Fred and uh, Philip and Jen. I, um, I know uh, you're here. Thank you, because uh, in January 2020, I went to IT services and went, uh, I need to get something called Microsoft Azure. <laughs> and they were like, you can have our license. And they completely helped and facilitated me with the infrastructure I needed. OK, so I'm, we're on the cloud because I don't believe we can do this. You know, so many academic projects write code, you know, write their own code, and they sit literally amazing ideas that are sitting on people's laptops in the university. And I was like, yeah, I actually want to get this out. I want to get this working. So actually, we were very lucky. We work from the beginning. I, I, I got um, Microsoft and SAS Analytics involved um, at the very beginning. And SAS Analytics, it's amazing too, because UCD already has a, a SAS license, a SAS VIA license, and I do. So then it saves me money because I actually just can put add-ons, the add-ons I need to run my analytics um, on my data. And, and uh, I add that on to UCD's license. So I go through chest and all of that and, and, and do that every year. So that's why I'm standing here is because the infrastructure has enabled me to do this project. And we wouldn't be able to do this and bring it into the hospital like we're in the rotunda doing this. We wouldn't be able to do that without um, without the infrastructure. And this is the whole idea. I've gone through this, but this is the idea. It's bringing good biochemistry with good data, with good clinical assessment, bringing that all together, utilizing an analytics platform in the cloud. And then we'll be able to give the information to the care provider at the right time, at the right time, but all of the information. And they can click into it. They can see where the information's come from. They can make an informed decision. 
It takes a village. <laughs> you can imagine I am privileged to stand up in front of you and represent the AI Premi team. I really am. But there's so many people involved in this. We are across the three Dublin maternity hospitals. We have people here on this slide with very little skin in the game other than the passion to help us succeed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, we've got patient groups that we're involved in. We've got business people, because look, you know, I, I, I rationalised a long time ago that, you know, you can't get this out to everybody who needs it unless you actually go down the commercial route. That took me a while, actually, to get my mind around it, but I know now that you have to do that. But we've also got incredible, um, and I'll just point out at the top right of the slide, Professor Geraldine Doyle, who um, just um, completed her tenure as director of the Michael Smurfit Business School. Um, but she's a, a health economist and she looks at value-based healthcare because we are not going to get this up and running unless, um, unless uh, it, it creates value for the hospitals. But we know it creates value, it saves lives, but unfortunately we have to show it as monetary value. So where are we? <laughs> so right now we're at 500 patients collected. We're really, you know, ramping up recruitment now. We need to get it, you know, it's all about data. But, um, uh, and I apologise, um, it's probably overfitted because we're only at 500 patients and we split this into a 70-30, um, a 70, 30, a 70 uh, training set and 30% um, validation set. But the area under the rock curve right now is 0.813. So yeah, okay, there's a misclassification, but isn't it better as a second opinion and also give the clinical care provider all of the information at the right time. And really, this is it's not just my vision, it's really the vision of the whole team. This is what we want to do. We want to get this to every person who needs it across the world. And, and we've been, we've, you know, it, you got to do lots of different things to get this out there. And we've been very lucky. We've been on a lot of different TV shows, I mean, might have read, we've won a lot of awards. We were named by UNESCO la, um, last year as um, in the top 100 projects using AI to solve sustainable development goals. And I think the reason that I'm standing here is we just won the Public Sector Digital Transformation Award. And, and you just see the, I'm not going to, the pointer doesn't work, but a little picture in the Sunday Business Post. But look, you know, we can win awards, but really it's all about the people and, and all about the research funding. And I hope you hear a lot more about us because at the end of the day, so many people are involved in this, but at the end of the day, it's really the work. And I've met so many patients along the way. And this is a, um, this is, um, this is a picture that I always I think about. Um, and this is a lady that came to me um, and uh, she lost her daughter to preeclampsia and she believes that if AI Premi existed, her daughter would still be alive. And that's, that drives me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we can get some uh, questions through Slido. We can get some, we have a few minutes for questions. Okay, so. Oh yeah, so, <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah. Um, no, you, no is the answer. So is Elizabeth? Oh, we just read out the question. For, oh, for okay. Yeah. Uh, is Elizabeth is, is Elizabeth Holmes' <laughs> idea of developing blood testing technology that could run hundreds of health tests on just one drop of blood achievable? No, and it never look. It never was. Uh, it never was. Uh, it's funny because my husband used to say to me, "Did you see that one, Elizabeth Holmes?" And I was like, "Yeah, that can't be work. How can someone know that much about blood that she's only 19?" It, it just, you know, and no experience. It just was never going to work. Never. Um, I. I think uh, the way she thought about it was never going to work, but there's there's other ways of doing it. And you know, I think utilizing machine learning and data, good data, and if you were able to bring all the, the data of the world together, I think you might be able to. Okay. Do you want to read out the next Yeah, question? and the next question, were any dedicated data scientists required <laughs> yeah. for this project, or was it just uh, UCD's IT, excellent ICT services, able to integrate data into the system? Oh, it's, it's everybody. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, if you sit beside me long enough, you'll be involved in this project. <laughs> this is the way it is. <laughs> you know, um, IT services, fundamental you know, enabling us to get the platforms, but yes, data scientists. And not only, you know, I was uh, on an interview during COVID, I don't know if you know him, Brian McNamee, Professor Brian McNamee is in computer science in UCD, he was on an interview and I was like, oh, 
and I was on the panel and I was like, oh, he's really good. <laughs> and I rang him up and said, any chance? And actually, he's no skin in the game, but he's been fabulous. And actually, yes, I've, uh, I've been very lucky. You know, we, we've now um, uh, got a, a bit more funding and uh, I now hire data scientists that pretty much tell me what to do. <laughs> um, how many babies and mothers' lives could be saved by air premium? I hope, I hope lots. And you know what? Even if we save one life, I know that kind of sounds a bit cheesy, but even if we save one life, the whole thing will be worth it. And that's the idea. You know, a lot of the statistics I gave you are not including South America and Africa because these women don't have access to hospitals. They're not counted. So phase version five, I hope, will be a dipstick test that they can use, use with their mobile phone. That's the idea. And I'm afraid that's, that's all we have time. time for. So I please you. put your hands together for <laughs> Professor McGuire. Thank you very much. That was amazing.